Okay. Thank um, you. We have uh, two attendees to... right now. Three. You can okay. see the count, right, Kathy? Yeah, I can see the count. Great. No. Okay, I, I want to welcome everyone um, to the District 1 meeting that we're, Sarah and I are hosting as district counselors. And I'm just going to wait a few minutes as um, other people join us. But the agenda was posted on the web and the first 40 minutes to an hour or whatever amount of time it takes us, we'll be focusing on the UMass and Amherst response as students have come back to campus and COVID. And Tony and Nancy will lead off with this. Um, I think, a Angela, why don't you put the agenda up so people can uh, see who our panelists are? I'm just uh, waiting a little bit to, more people have told me they were attending this than I see in the attendee list. Okay, and can you make it a little bigger? Or a lot bigger? Is that better? Yeah, that's great. So okay. the first part, the first part of this will be focusing on COVID with um, leading off with Nancy Buffoni and Tony Maroulis. And they told me that they're a dynamic duo. So they have a way of working this together. And they have a few overhead charts that may help answer some questions, but may prompt other questions. And then Paul will come in. But most of this period is for people to ask questions. So I want to encourage you to ask questions either by using the raise your hand function when you log in, or we've also opened up the Q&A box where we, if you would prefer just typing a question in, a few people sent questions in in advance, um, but not that many of you did. Um, so Sarah, do you want to say hi also and welcome everyone? Hi everybody from District 1, I'm glad you came. It's always good to see everyone or at least hear you. Yes, definitely. So thank you all. Um, and I'm literally just gonna turn this over because I don't wanna have it be um, talking heads. You know, At some point we'll figure out whether we can bring attendees into meetings safely so we can all see each other. But right now, this is the best we can do. So Tony, Nancy, it's yours. Hi, well, thank you so much, Kathy and Sarah, uh, for joining us today. We're really excited to be here. I'm Nancy Buffone. I um, actually lived in District 1 for many years, just north of campus, and uh, now I'm over in District 2. Tony, do you want to introduce yourself? Sure. Hi, everyone. I'm uh, Tony Maroulis, Executive Director of External Relations and University Events. I used to live in North Amherst, but that was a long time ago. Uh, I've lived in Pelham since 2004. Um, so uh, thanks for having us here today. We look forward to taking questions. So um, as Kathy said, we do have um, some uh, in, uh, presentation that we can share. And um, we want to just kind of give you some overall information. And then we're looking forward to your questions. Can we, um, Angela, can we pull up the PowerPoint? And so um, we can scroll through um, to the, yep, yeah, thank you. So we wanna just start talking a little, a little bit about um, testing. I, let me say, um, you know, I, I also wanna thank um, Paul for having us here as well. We have worked really closely with the town. Um, we always have, um, but especially since this, um, global pandemic hit, we have been um, talking uh, quite regularly. We have weekly meetings, uh, Tony and I do with Dave and Paul, where we talk about um, any of the issues that are coming up with COVID related and not COVID related. Um, Tony can talk a little bit about the um, on-call meetings that happen on uh, Mondays, um, every Monday during the semesters. And also um, since the end of July, we've had our um, uh, fall, reopening town gown working group that has been meeting every week. So um, it's really uh, been great to make sure that we've got collaboration and partnership um, throughout this process. So when it comes to testing, uh, 
Some of you may be aware that we have opened up a pretty extensive testing site at the Mullen Center. It's our um, public health promotion center is what we're calling it. And since August 6, we have done um, over 46,000 tests. These are all asymptomatic tests. Um, if we can go to the next slide. So we've got um, a dashboard that we update um, every day as we get um, the results back. And so I, I do have the URL there if people want to look at it closely. Um, for testing, we have required that all students who are either living on campus or living off campus but accessing the campus because they have face-to-face um, -face classes, they're required to be tested twice a week. Our students who are living off campus were tested upon arrival and um, were tested a couple times a week for the first couple of weeks. Um, and now we are strongly encouraging all of them to come in twice a week. And we've had pretty good um, response to that. The students are coming in um, and getting their tests. We're also testing faculty and staff um, regularly if they are accessing the campus. Um, so as you can see, we have a very low positivity rate so far. Um, we're really um, thankful to our students and, and the broader community for following um, you know, all of public health guidance, social distancing and wearing masks. We think that this has really led to um, this low positivity rate and we um, have been encouraging everybody to, to stick with it. If we can go to the next slide, um, one of the questions that often comes up um, is what happens when someone tests positive. Um, and so we do have um, additional information on every case. This is just a screenshot, but you can go in and you can see um, if it's a student, faculty or staff member who's tested positive, where they are living and where they are um, uh, doing their quarantine and isolation. Um, we have a really long history of working very closely with the town of Amherst Public um, Health Department, and we really value that relationship. And um, so when we have someone who is a student who is living off campus, we do, uh, the campus does the contact tracing, but we do that hand in hand with the town of Amherst. Um, and if somebody is living off campus um, and needs to uh, be quarantined, we'll have a conversation with them and find out what, is, you know, what are their current living conditions and is it appropriate? Are they in a space that is safe to do so? If they are not, we will offer them space on campus where they can quarantine. So a big piece of this has been also around messaging and how we're talking to, um, the, um, talking to our students in our community. If we can go to the next slide. So we created a public health campaign that was really driven by our students. Um, they said to us loud and clear that they do not want to be told what to do, that they really want to be viewed as part of the solution. And so we have really leaned into that and leaned into a culture of compliance. So we can just scroll through these next couple of slides. These are just um, examples of some of the signage that we have on campus and that we have shared with our uh, off-campus landlords, especially at the apartment complexes. And we've been uh, using social media uh, pretty uh, aggressively around um, some, of this, um, some of the messaging. And we'll be having a very visible bus campaign in the next uh, few weeks as well. So we're really talking um, regularly and, and um, pretty strongly with our students and the, the, our campus community about expectations uh, um, for social distancing, wearing masks, and how to, how to be safe. So um, with that, I'm going to turn it over to Tony to talk about um, some of the conversations in the neighborhoods as well. Great. Thanks, Nancy. So uh, one of the things that you may have heard about, um, Paul has talked about this and it's been in the paper, is what we call our knock and talks, which are our outreach efforts and also follow up efforts in certain cases. And so if we can go to the next slide. So a, a knock and talk, um, you really is a, a little bit of our old fashioned PR. And what I mean by that is not public relations, it's personal relations. We're getting to know our students in the community. We are um, able to uh, engage face to face, as Nancy was talking about, and the town has uh, messaged this out. And I just love this phrase. We are trying to create a culture of compliance with our student body um, and get them to be a part of the team. Um, Kathy, do you have your hands up? Yeah, Nant, um, Angela, can you 
probably put it on slideshow. Just make, I got a text, someone asked the slide be larger. And I think if you put it on slideshow, and if you flip to where he is, it, it, it people can't read it. So if you just go to where he was, sorry, Tony. Didn't oh, that's okay. Um, yeah. And so if we can just go back one slide, Angela, thank you. Um, so that, that culture of compliance is something that we're trying to create and working in partnership with our students, because that is the best way to uh, work with a public health message. Um, that, that is, you know, how the town is working with um, all of our, all of its residents. And uh, this is uh, something that we've found successful over the years. So a big part of what we do during these knock and talks is we emphasize what an appropriate behavior looks like in a pandemic. And, and you know, we give people, uh, you know, really try, try to give them the guidelines for, for what, you know, how to be safe. And if they are having gatherings, what a safe gathering looks like. And so that's 10 people or fewer where there's physical distancing, where there's masks and where people are playing within their pods. Um, so, you know, we really try to, you know, instruct as, as much as possible, give the best advice on, on staying well below the governor's guidance of 25 um, that is for any kind of outdoor gathering. Um, so we also have, uh, we do some education on party smart registration, which uh, is not a, a licensed party, um, but it is, again, a tool and some guidance for our students on how to have safe, um, safe gatherings. This year we call it our COVID edition. The idea behind Party Smart is that if there is a gathering and then there is a noise complaint that is associated with an address, the uh, resident will get a call from the local uh, or from Amherst police. We also have this program in Hadley as well and maybe starting it in Sunderland very soon. Uh, but that call will give the, uh, the resident uh, 20 minutes to uh, uh, disband the party. Uh, and get it back under control or the police will come and then a noise violation will be uh, written. So it's a way for uh, our students to manage their parties. It's been a very successful program. Uh, well over a thousand parties have been registered in the last several years with very few, and I, I'm sorry I don't have the stats with me, but very few um, of those uh, events have led to any uh, police action. So, um, so we're really pleased how that's wor working. Again, walk-in talks are all educational in nature. And if we can go to the next slide. So this is our team. Uh, as you can see, it is a great uh, town gown uh, mix of us. This is something that we've been doing for several years. Uh, we have a couple of new additions to this team. Uh, one being Kat Newman, who is uh, not only part of uh, UMass off-campus student life, she was a part of the team there, but she's now the town of Amherst COVID. I, I have ambassador down here. She's actually the, uh, the leader of that effort. Um, Paul brought her aboard, and so she's doing uh, work in you know, two areas, uh, doing double duty for both the town and the gown. Um, now we also have our COVID ambassadors out uh, in public working with us as well, going on these knock and talks, as well as team positive presence. And of course, we have the best addition, uh, and that's Winston, the Amherst Police Comfort Dog, who has just joined our team uh, in the last week and a half. Um, and if we can go to the next slide. You can see I get to hang out with Winston every now and then, which um, always makes me uh, happy. So as he gets bigger, he's gonna have a lot more work to do. And uh, he's a great way for us to uh, open in conversation and, and engage with uh, students as we're out and about. I, I like yeah. that you added Cat Newman and the dog Winston, uh, Tony. <laughs> I, you know, I, I didn't even think about that, Paul, but, but good catch there. Cats and dogs, that's what we're, that's what we've Living together. Here. Yep. Uh, we can go to the next slide. Um, so this is just a little sample of where we visited this year. Um, this is not unusual. We're out and about in all of these neighborhoods throughout the year. There have been a couple of different places that are kind of new to us and, and that'll happen each and every year as new um, houses are um, rented throughout the community. Um, South Pleasant Street is one example of, uh, you know, an area that we normally have not had to concentrate on before. Um, again, uh, some of this is just outreach, uh, you know, that, that happens proactively um, in some of those neighborhoods, such as uh, areas that we always know uh, have a lot of student rentals, such as Sunset and Fearing. Um, and in that area, some of these are follow-ups to uh, either COVID complaints that are received by the town, or uh, police action that has happened where we do uh, stop by, speak with the students about um, expectations going forward. 
Um, so these are, again, these are really great, uh, you know, interactions for us. One of the things that we're able to do this year is, is ask about testing and, and checking in with students whether or not uh, they have been, uh, you know, availing themselves of testing. One of the things that, that we have found is, are, are not only students proactively, um, you know, going to the Mullen Center for, uh, for testing, but they're, you know, working out pacts with their roommates uh, about responsible behavior, um, talking about trying to keep gatherings very small. It, it, it has been pretty heartening being out there. Next slide, please. And so, you know, one of the questions that always comes up is, you know, about discipline, because I, I think that there is, you know, the thought that, you know, the town does work and the university doesn't. Um, in fact, we work pretty closely together. Um, and this has been an ongoing uh, way of working. Um, I, I'd say our, you know, the work that we've done since 2014 um, in the wake of the, the you know, so-called Blarney blowout um, has been, you know, something that has been a model for, um, for town gown relations throughout the country. It's sometimes hard for, for residents to believe that in the town of Amherst, and I understand that, but um, a lot of things that we've come up with over the last several years have been um, stolen by other college communities, and, and we're really pretty proud of that. Um, so if we can go to the next, next slide. So um, you all may have heard about the UMass Community Agreement, which was put into place this year uh, for uh, in the wake of the pandemic. Uh, as we brought students back to the area, we asked them all to, uh, to sign the agreement. Um, and uh, you know, good number of our, our students uh, have. Uh, that was, um, however, w one of the things that you know, people were a little bit confused about because the agreement is really an educational tool as much as anything else about public health and a pledge towards safety um, is what kind of um, sanctions would happen if people didn't adhere to the agreement. And one of the things that you know, we just wanna make very clear is that the agreement, um, while there was a lot of fanfare around that, it is always governed by the code of student conduct. And if a student doesn't sign the code of student, they're, they're, as a student at UMass, they um, are subject to the code. So, um, you know, I won't read this for you. I think you can all see this here, but it is binding to all students of UMass, regardless of location. Um, and that is really uh, key when, when, uh, w with regard to disciplinary action. We can go to the next slide. And so um, these are the sanctions of the Code of Student Conduct. I think the ones that are most relevant here are the ideas of, uh, or, or the um, uh, suspension, or expulsion, which I think a lot of folks want to know about. Um, in fact, uh, when there is, uh, you know, any kind of police action, if, if the police uh, have a um, uh, levy, a, a noise violation ticket, those, uh, uh, the, the, where the action is taken, the, that, that is referred to the conduct office and the dean of students office. Um, at which time uh, students, uh, we can go to the next slide, um, have due process under the code. Um, disciplinary action is handled by the, the Student Conduct and Community Standards Office. Um, there are, uh, you know, again, there is a due process. The disciplinary sanctions are effective at the completion of the, of the conduct process. Most cases are uh, resolved within 14 days. Of course, uh, the uh, sanction is always dependent upon uh, the actual case, right? So for example, there might be a noise violation in which students do receive a ticket, but are compliant. That would be looked at, um, using this just as an example, that would be looked at um, rather kindly throughout the conduct process. And there may be, um, the sanction may be to uh, be reflective and there might be some restorative justice practices that go along with that. However, for more severe cases, suspension or expulsion uh, certainly can happen. Again, the thing that we're trying to do here always is about education and about, uh, you know, tr trying to do everything that we can to have students reflect upon their situation and, um, and you know, be able to make good. And, um, in most cases that this works, 98% of the cases, I, th I think, it, it, you know, we, we, met, we do not see a repeat violation. So we go to the next slide. Um, so these are some of the examples of the behaviors that 
uh, violate the code of student conduct, um, disruptive behavior, uh, noise disturbances or disorderly conduct. Um, the noise disturbances I know uh, are, are particular concern uh, to this area. Also, um, you know, the uh, public health issues, you know, all of, all of these things uh, can come under the code. Again, we, we try to educate first before we ever get to the point of discipline. Um, but uh, if you go to the next slide, I think this might be it. Okay, so we are done there. Um, so, uh, you know, that is it in a nutshell. However, I think the one thing that uh, I will say is that, you know, there, there's a lot of concern about, you know, whether or not there are follow-up actions. Privacy regulations do uh, restrict us from being too specific about the types of uh, discipline that that we uh, do meet out. However, there are aggregate, um, we will be releasing aggregate data about midway through the semester and also at the end of the semester, which is something that we customarily do. So, um, so I think that's it. Nancy, do you have anything to add on that, um, that part? And just a couple of quick things. One, I would note that Tony and I both work in university relations. We don't work in student affairs and campus life. So we are not a part of the, the disciplinary and, and, and conduct um, process. So um, we can try and answer questions today, but may have to get back to people because it is really not our area of expertise. Um, I will add though, what we've heard a lot from both um, uh, public health um, colleagues on campus and um, those in the conduct mm -hmm. office, um, just two things to remember. Um, when, you know, if we have students who are living off campus and they um, are suspended or expelled, we no longer have any kind of jurisdiction over them. And so, and there's no guarantee that they are going to just go back to their parents' house. They may stay in, in their rental and it, it can be a challenging situation at times then. So we really um, try to avoid that um, if possible for many reasons. But also from the public health perspective, a lot of what we've heard um, from our team is that leading into this culture of compliance as opposed to strict discipline, um, it impacts how we handle, uh, how, we, how our students trust us and how they interact with us. And it impacts the success of contact tracing. Um, and so that's something that we're also very um, attuned to and, and try and be um, sensitive to. So sorry, that went a little bit longer than, than we talked about Kathy and, and Sarah, but um, we'll take any questions. Okay, Paul, do you want to add anything or do you want to go to questions? Um, um, you're muted, Paul. Always happens. Um, I just have a couple points to, and then I have a couple slides to show and then I think going to questions, there'll be lots of conversation after that, if that's okay, Kathy and sure. Sarah? Okay. So there's two initiatives from the town um, that we have done. Which one is the hotline, and Angela Mills has is, is, is been uh, operating, helping to operate the, the hotline with our other community participation officers. It's a call-in number dedicated to this, um, and it's also an email address, covidconcerns at amherstma.gov. It's something that we are monitoring every day of the week. Uh, Angela's here on weekends. We are actually, uh, after monitoring, monitoring it for a couple weeks, we are going to have it answered live during certain hours on the weekends when we think it's the busiest time. Um, so uh, this is a number when you can call, when you're not sure it really rises to the level of calling the police, it's not necessarily a noise, it's just a concern you have. Like there are too many people gathered together. There's a lot of people without masks. There's um, whatever it is that concerns you. Um, we retake it, we record the information, we refer it to the right people. Um, we keep a running tab on what's being, what's being called on so we can sort of track where the areas are of concern and what the topics of concern are. And we review this um, at a regular COVID core meetings. Um, so it started on August 30th. These numbers are a little bit out of date, but we, it involves the inspection services department, the health department, the police, and our new ambassadors. And the biggest sources have been noise that aren't quite rising to the level of uh, calling the police, but just uh, noise. I hear noise and it sounds like it's too big a party type things gatherings, mask wearing, and questions about testing. Some people are calling saying, I need to get a test. I'm, you know, I've got my daughter coming and I'm not sure where to go. And Angela gives them, is a resource for all that kind of thing. 
the second thing, which is not moving. Oh yeah. Um, we, I want to talk about the COVID ambassadors and these, this is a new initiative that the town has. Um, and um, so these, these are, uh, this is we, where we talked about Kat Newman, who is also employed part-time at the university and part-time for the town. Uh, she has ses assembling this group of um, people and it's not just students working, it it's can be high school students, it can be older people. We're recruiting as broad a, a group of people as possible um, to walk around, talk to people, uh, engage with people who don't have masks. If, if someone's walking downtown, they don't have a mask, they have a, a bag of masks, they can offer them a mask. Uh, and uh, just generally to create this, as Tony referenced, the culture of compliance. And they wear these uh, bright yellow t-shirts. Um, and uh, and we, again, we're sort of, we've got them working on nights and weekends for the most part. And that's, and and as, as we ramp up additional people, we'll have them out in different neighborhoods as well. Um, and just if you see someone with a bright yellow t-shirt, say hi to them. They've been at the farmer's market in, uh, deal, interacting with people and things like that. So those are the two initiatives the town has taken on top of all the work, the knock and talk and all the work that the university has been doing. And I, I do wanna mention that, um, you know, Nancy talked about how the town and, and the university work well together. We do work well together. Um, there is, you know, we're working through some really difficult things over the last few months. Um, there's friction. There's always, you know, if there weren't friction, you'd worry. Um, but I think really we're, we're both, both group, groups are coming at it with, you know, good people with good intentions trying to do the right thing for our community. And the university takes an orientation, you know, dealing with Nancy and Tony, they really think about the community. So recognize and just give a shout out to them for the good work that they're doing daily on this. Thanks, Paul. I think we'll open it for questions. And right now there's one hand up and three people have submitted questions on Q&A. So I, uh, why don't we start with the one hand that's up and Angela, you, it's Kathleen Carroll. Um, so can you I, bring Kathleen into the room so she can ask her questions? Hi, Kathleen. I think you need to unmute your mic. It looks muted. Can we unmute her mic for her? I don't know how to unmute her mic. We can't hear you unless you unmute your mic. There she goes. How's that, how, how's that Kathy? You are, you, you are with us right now. Okay, the, uh, I have a couple of questions. Um, uh, thank you very much, everybody. I uh, live on Fisher Street, which is one of the um, neighborhoods mentioned. And we have had uh, quite an active uh, neighborhood up until this weekend when the cold weather came. Um, I have a few questions about what triggers um, contact with the university administration. Is it a noise complaint or a COVID concern complaint? Well, or either both. one, I can answer that one first. I, I know you had a, a, a series of several questions, Ms. Carroll. So, um, so this one, um, so, you know, the, the knock and talk interaction, you know, could just be, could come from the COVID hotline or it could be a, a police response. So there were two addresses in your neighborhood um, that, that we have met with, um, one on Harris Street, one on the corner of North Pleasant and Fisher. Um, in both of those cases, uh, I think uh, one that, you know, I probably can disclose this without any kind of problem that, that you know, in, in one of the cases at, at uh, the Harris Street location, I think the outcome was really quite good. Uh, one of the young women that lived there is, has just joined the COVID ambassador team. So, uh, so I think that certainly they, they get it over there. Um, that gathering received uh, only a warning from the police the night that it happened and we had a um, you know, we've had a really great talk with them and, and I think that they're fully on board. Um, the corner of North Pleasant, for example, um, you know, I think the details of, of that particular incident, the, the one where the police were called was initiated by the, the, the residents that live there themselves because of uh, unwanted guests. 
Um, we have also been in touch with the landlord. So, you know, again, I think that one thing that I want to put into perspective is that it, it's, it's really a community response where we bring in, um, you know, it's not just Bill Laramie and I knocking on the door and looking, you know, like someone's uncle uh, showing up there, but we get the landlords involved. We, we do have our peer ambassadors. And, you know, I think that this kind of team approach really does work. Um, we did not get to the one on your street on Fisher. Um, I, I, Bill and I, you know, we goofed on that one. We didn't have uh, the address with us and that house really did not look like a rental. So we didn't knock there. Uh, we'll follow up. We'll talk to the, the folks there, but the police action has been taken. So that has been referred over to the conduct office by now. Um, thank you. I, I think uh, um, I'd like to share that the neighbors on Fisher Street and Harris Street, we have connected with um, the landlords and the property managers. And um, I think we, we've got a good mechanism in place to uh, communicate with the residents there. And at Fisher Street, I think what the landlord did there after the complaint is that he immediately um, organized a face-to-face -face meeting with the residents there and the neighbors. And we had a very cordial, socially distanced um, exchange. And they volunteered their phone number to have us call them if we have any concerns. So I, I'm really encouraged that, you know, it sounds like these programs are starting to work, um, but we have a lot of uh, warm weather still coming up. And I, I think um, I'm concerned about repeat offenders. I'm also concerned about uh, people, and I know there's, you have no control over this, but it does happen because I've been here for a long time and I've seen it is that uh, students from out of town will ride around in these neighborhoods and look for parties or look for some kind of gathering and they'll stop and, um, you know, start partying and okay. increase that. Okay. And I know that's not, nothing you can do, um, but I just wanted to share it. I, I think that that's a great point though. And, and we do have a little bit of a mechanism for that. Um, this goes back to things that we've learned from, you know, years ago with, um, from 2014. I'm, I'm not gonna refer to that incident one more time, but um, in, in the event that um, a student from another institution uh, is, uh, you, you gets a police response and, you know, that information does get passed on to our Dean of Students Office who sometimes, that, who can and often do, uh, refer those names to the Dean of Students offices at their respective campus. So, um, so we've, you know, we've worked on some of that and, you know, and, and, and made sure that uh, the word gets out that people um, have come into our community and, and created unwelcome um, behaviors. And so, um, so we do have a mechanism. I mean, I think that there's, there's always things that, you know, we, we do share that information with other institutions. So when the police does, uh, they do finally are issuing a citation, do they collect the names of all four residents or just the person who answers the door? Uh, it, 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 you know, has depended in, in the past. You know, it, was, it was generally one person might get cited this year. Uh, that has, has changed. Um, I think, and I'm not going to speak for the police action. I can leave that to Paul, but um, there have been... Uh, multiple tickets uh, on, on a location uh, at most of the noise uh, stops at this point, right, Paul? Yes, there have been. So what does that mean? So there was more than one, one 300, there was only one 300? Correct. No, there, there would be a $300 fine for each. Oh, oh, that's really good. Okay. Thank you. You're welcome. I, I do have one other question, and I know this, uh, well, Angela, I think, told me this was funded by a grant, and I was wondering when the end date is for the grant. So the ambassadors uh, are funded through the town through a, a um, funding that we have called CARES Act funding, and that's, that money is lasting through December 31. At this point in time, um, we're hoping and hoping that it'll be extended into the next calendar year. Thank you. I do want to make clear, though, that the, the work that we're doing, these knock and talks, are, mm -hmm. aren't, aren't funded independently. And, and you know, we're out there um, doing this work every year. Um, 
uh, you know, this year, I'm sorry, I was a little distracted by my wife yelling at my dog. Um, but <laughs> so, uh, so I'm sorry, I just lost, lost track. But yes, we do this. We do this every year. Yeah, so I just, I think it's really important. I think you mentioned this, but to say again, so every week, especially during the academic year, there is a meeting on Monday morning that the fire department, the police department, the U UMass Police Department, Tony, student service, they all get together and go over the, the weekend, all the calls that came in over the weekend, they review the, the, the sort of ambulance runs that, were, that happened and, and the inspection services are there it's called the on-call meeting and they meet every week and go through the everything that happened over the weekend and say what are we going to do about these are we seeing a trend are there things um you know tony's part of those meetings so it's it's and it's that's been going on for years so, so that's not new um but it's a really i think that's a really th important thing because it means the people who are the boots on the ground are actually talking to each other saying i'm seeing a trend here this is what's happening so i think that's a really positive thing and a model for other communities as well Okay, I have, um, I think, um, Mary Sarah, I do see that your hand is up, but I'm going to read a couple of these questions that were written and they came in just before your hand went up. So we have one from Josh Norege for Nancy Buffon. Are the positive tests that you listed, are they cumulative or is the number 18 that you showed just for one day, is that the total total since you started testing? So um, the 18, and great question, thank you. The 18 is um, the cumulative number since we started asymptomatic testing of our students, faculty, and staff. So that was around August 6th, I believe. Um, if you go onto the dashboard site, you can see that it'll say, um, as of right now, I believe that there's been one case in the last uh, 24, 48 hours, I think since the last reporting um, time period. And there's trend lines, so it'll show you, you know, what's happened over the past week, how long is it taking for us to get results back. Um, so there's really, it, it's, there's very rich information there. Um, and again, this just focuses on the, uh, the dashboard itself focuses on the asymptomatic testing. If you go in and you look at the um, additional information about each case that does cover um, uh, those tests that might be happening at UHS where people are symptomatic. So we, we are reporting on um, all of that information, but there's just 18 asymptomatic cases since August 6th. Okay, the second um, question and comment I have, and I just want to acknowledge that in the participant list that we can see, but not everyone can see, we have three counselors um, who are listening in, but Alyssa Brewer, um, she reminded us of this um, more than once, but definitely the other night, that this, the number of people that can be in a house, it's not capped, it's capped at 25, but it's a measurement that's eight per thousand feet. Is that information always in your hands when you go to visit a house? So a small house might not be able to have any more than eight people. Um, so do you, do you have that kind of information? Do the ambassadors have that information um, in terms of what is a bigger gathering than is um, and would be non-compliant with the state law. So uh, I, I just did text, I, I texted Alyssa the answer to this just a couple minutes ago. But um, so the answer is yes. We, 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 so when I said 25 before, it, I, I hope it was clear. I, I, think I, I think I said it, that we're talking about 25 outside. That, that's the governor's regulations. We're counseling everybody is under 10 for anything that they do. Keep it small, keep it safe is the, the way that we're, we're you know, messaging this out. We have handed out uh, through off-campus student life and the COVID ambassadors are handing these out as well. Um, we are handing out nifty masks uh, like this. This is our UMass mask. Uh, but we are also handing out gift uh, or welcome bags. And in the welcome bags are the regulations on what, it, what the size of gatherings are allowed by law. So this 1,000 square feet uh, uh, messaging, you know, um, which most most people do not have, you know, the, the proper size requirements to have 25 in their house. Um, students have that information in their hands. Um, again, the 25 number, that, that's the, the governor's number, we're talking 10. Um, however, some students are very aware of, of what the governor's regulations are and, um, you know, most of them are trying to abide by staying below that threshold no matter what. So. Tony, am I right? I, I know that uh, maybe at the end of August, there were some um, slightly larger gatherings, but 
Um, since then, I believe that most of the um, responses, um, you know, the police responses have found that the number, the gathering sizes have been very low. For the most part, yes. I, I think that there is a, a very small percentage, about 2% that have been over, um, over 12. I, I think that, um, and, and I think Scott Livingstone said that, Chief Livingstone said that at, at our last uh, town gown meeting. Um, so, um, you know, we're confident that students are, are getting it from a numbers perspective. Okay, I think I'm gonna bounce back and forth between the Q and A's and writing and um, let's call on Mary Sayre. Mary has her hand up and bring her in, Angela. And Mary, you need to unmute yourself. Um, you're on. Okay, you're thanks. Um, Mary Sayre, um, Pine Street in Amherst. So I had a, just uh, three questions. I don't want that. Um, one is, do you know how many students are living off campus who are working just primarily remotely? Um, no. <laughs> um, we, so this is a place where we are still working with um, our campus partners and our students, um, encouraging our students to be uh, submitting their local address. Um, so we, um, and I haven't actually looked at the numbers recently, and I don't know, Tony, if you have, but um, I think we have a sense of it, but we do not have um, definitive numbers of how many are living in the community. Uh, do you yeah. have any, any sense like a thousand or five thousand or any ballpark figure? So uh, what I think what I can say, Ms. Sayre, is that, that we are, um, you know, in talking with landlords, uh, the market was incredibly volatile leading up to the university's ultimate decision of having a thousand students on campus and then, um, you know, going fully remote for, for most students. Uh, the, there are vacancy rates um, throughout the area. Some complexes are, you know, filled. Puffton Village, uh, I think, you know, is, is maxed out, which, um, but there are several others with um, vacancy rates. So I don't want to put a ballpark figure on it, but I can tell you that our off-campus population is smaller than it was last year. We, we did not get, you know, it, I, I know that there was concern that, that there was um, you know, a run on apartments and overcrowding. Um, certainly there, there's probably, you know, instances of overcrowding and that's something that we, you know, through our knock and talks and with uh, John Thompson, the building inspector, and, um, you know, we discover throughout the year and, and we try to remedy, but um, we are certainly lower off campus than we have in the past. And so if our undergraduate population is 22,000, and we had 14,500 on campus last year or thereabouts, um, that difference is, say, 7,500 or 8,000. We're, we're lower than that this year. I, I would also just add, and, and we don't have any sense of numbers on this, but, you know, similar to where we have um, students who are, um, you know, fully remote and living off campus, um, we know that there are um, Amherst natives who are in college, whose colleges are remote, who have um, decided they don't want to live at home with mom and dad, and they are renting locally and doing their school remotely. But so, so not my point is not all college students um, are UMass students or Amherst College students or Hampshire College students right now. Okay. Um, another question would be, if a student um, tests positive and is in an off-campus house, um, is there follow-up? For them to know that they're quarantined and that they're not, they're not quarant they're not going out into the community. Or the other thing is their roommates. Um, and the other thing I'm actually quite concerned about um, is what happens if a if a student is sick and feeling really, you know, awful. Um, is there someone that gets them to a doctor or, uh, you know, gets them medical attention? So um, if, a, if a student tests positive, we work really closely with the town of Amherst Health Department on contact tracing. UMass will take responsibility for the contact tracing, but we really do it hand in hand with um, the town department. 
Um, and that includes, you know, talking with roommates and finding out what the living conditions are like. And it, it's really um, an extensive program. And we're doing this, and I should have noted, noted this earlier, our, the reason that we have been able to do the 46,000 asymptomatic testing is because of our incredible students in the College of Nursing who are really helping to staff that. And similarly with contact tracing, um, we, in addition to professional staff who are working on this, we've got students from the uh, School of Public Health and Health Sciences who are actively engaged in this. And it's really, um, it's been a great experience um, all around for them. The, um, so if a student tests positive and they're living off campus, there'll be conversations about what are the living conditions? Can that person safely um, quarantine? Or um, do we need to you know, offer them uh, space on campus if, it, if it's just not, if they're not in a living condition where um, they can safely quarantine? So there'll be um, lots of conversations and we'll, we'll work with them to make sure that they are in a, a safe environment and that the people that they are close to are protected. Um, we, as far as um, if a student isn't feeling well, they can go to um, University Health Services. They still have full access to University Health Services, even if they don't have classes on campus. Um, and we will uh, take care of them and support them as they need to be. Okay, great. Thanks. Um, one final question. I've gotten notice because I get alerts from, not alerts, but um, information about UMass activities. And I see there's going to be a homecoming. Mm -hmm. And I'm just curious about what, what that means. It is um, fully virtual. It'll be just like this on Zoom. <laughs> yeah. They, they've okay. got um, well, a week long of activities of all different kinds, but they are all virtual. Um, we have done the same with uh, our family weekend. All of the activities are virtual. Oh, thank you. That I mean, it's kind of disappointing. I grew up in Amherst with homecomings, and it was always really fun. Yeah. So, I mean, it's it's tough, but okay. Thank you very much. That's all my questions. Okay, I'll, I'll read out the other questions. One of them um, from Tony Cunningham actually goes with a question about, do you know how many people are living off campus? Because she wanted to know if you know them, do you know how what percentage of them have been tested? So I think if you don't know how many are living off campus, you can't, I, it just, th the question was, you know, how well can you know that you're reaching that group and testing well, I, I, Yeah, so I, could t I can answer that part though. Um, so, so out of the 46,000 tests, I can't tell you how many unique tests there are right now, but uh, if we went back when we were in the vicinity of 30,000 tests, we had about 7,500 unique undergraduates that were tested within the testing pool. So, um, so you know, that doesn't count, uh, th that also counts those that are be being there twice a week, but 7,500 uh, is what we had in there. So we're getting a large number of those off-campus students. Uh, and, and so, you know, by opening up the testing pool now for, you know, uh, or the testing opportunities twice a week, um, again, I, I don't know what the new and updated numbers are, but, uh, we're quite confident that we're getting um, most, if not all, of our off-campus students. So the other night, this is completely a segue that's not related, but we were talking about the census undercount for, mm. uh, for, for Amherst, and one thought that came out, if you know off-campus students, can you promote, have you, reg have you registered, have you been counted by this census? So there's sharing this information to the extent you can with the town on where you know students are actually living in on off campus would be useful for us to know about residents because those addresses and names change so frequently. Yeah, and so we, we have done that. Um, and and I, and I know this is an important piece and I, I was actually a part of our census response. Um, you know, on campus, they were that was easily counted because we had group quarters enumeration. We were able to just send in a file that um, had you know our relevant uh, directory information and that that counted um, whatever our last year's number was, which I think was again four, I said fourteen five before I think it was fourteen three because we were over capacity. Um, the off campus numbers where we had addresses, we did give that to the Census Bureau, um, but it was notoriously unreliable. Um, and what I mean by that is before you know we really still figuring out, you know, uh, and, and we're doing a better job of that this year with getting off-campus student addresses and, and, and asking students to 
uh, put in a local address. But, um, you know, I think the, the data that we gave, uh, what we had, we did give to the Census Bureau as well. Um, I haven't kept up in the last couple of weeks where, where our numbers are, but um, I'm hoping they're better than the 65% that I saw some, some time ago. Um, we are a difficult community to count, and I think we would have had some great success because we had some good partnerships uh, with the SGA and with um, uh, Representative Dimes' office, but with the town and, and Brianna Sunrud, you know, like with, with the Complete Count Committee, um, I think the pandemic has just really thrown a wrench into all of this. So I'm seeing that we have uh, another question. I'm sorry to take us off into the census land, but it did relate to how many people are here living in, in houses. Um, so the, this question is coming in from Robin on um, worrying about the risk of spread that um, if a party happens and then people leave the party and move out, um, that just doing a noise violation, um, the noise isn't going to kill us, but potentially the spread would kill us. So do, do you some in some way know who was there? And then is this part of the contact tr tracing if you know, if you if then something happens, this uh, notion that a small gathering can infect a lot of people, um, it only takes one who then moves around. So Nancy, do you want to take that or? So I, I, I can do it. Um, so contact tracing, you know, I, I think as, as Tony or Nancy said, is that it, it's divided up between the town and the university. Both uh, the town and the university have a public health nurses. We have dedicated teams who do contact tracing. Amherst College also has public health nurses are hired. The school department also has a public health nurse who's, and we're user, utilizing school nurses to help with contact tracing. So they're very active on that. They're, they have certain metrics that they follow. Uh, they're very uh, diligent to contact tracing. As soon as there's a COVID uh, positive case, it happens instantaneously, no matter what time it, it happens, people start uh, category, categorizing who that person had contact with and they start calling them and talking to the people they've had contact with. It's not everybody they happen to walk by or anything like that. There are certain metrics that they use in terms of, is this person uh, likely to have some kind of um, contact with the person who's COVID positive to have um, received a viral load or whatever they, they call it, the viral load. Um, and they're, and that's changing all the time. You know, they, they keep learning more as this disease progresses. Um, so very aggressive contact tracing, really done very cooperatively. And uh, the our, our public health uh, director, is, who's also a public health nurse, is talking with Ann Becker at the university multiple times a day on these, these things. Um, so you know, the concern, I understand the concern is that there's a party and then that's, that's the worry that there's a party um, and then it gets spread. But, you know, it's the same approach we take for any gathering. It's not just students, it's any gathering, um, you know, and it's a, so it, we, we need to collect the data on who was in that grouping or something or anything like that. Yeah, I'm looking to see whether we have any other, um, one of the um, questions that had been, um, okay, another one just came in, I think. Um, it's, uh, this is from Meg Gage. Is it possible that we working with UMass could recruit students to engage in positive community activity, public service, work together on a safety issue? Um, so that it's sort of spreading, I, I guess it's building on the notion of the ambassador program. So, um, hi Meg. Um, good, to, uh, good to hear from you. Um, so yeah, we, we do that in a lot of different uh, cases already. Um, I mean, I, I think, uh, and, and we're open to any suggestions on this. I, I can tell you that, that we've just had a meeting in the Grantwood uh, neighborhood about three weeks ago. Um, and the, these, there are ongoing concerns within that community um, or, or in that area around uh, some student rentals there. Um, we brought together last week, or I'm sorry, again, three weeks ago, uh, we brought together a, a number of community members um, and some student residents as well um, to sit down, socially distance uh, outside in, in, in a cul-de-sac and you know, talked about ways in which we can mitigate some noise issues. I mean, that, that neighborhood's built a little bit like a bowl, so every bit of noise is amplified. Um, but having the students there was great. It was, it was an opportunity for them to meet the residents, 
um, and, and uh, for some really good positive interactions and, and great ideas. Um, so, you know, we'd love to replicate that uh, in, in different areas. We, um, Bill Laramie uh, and I have, uh, you know, along with Sally Lenowski, we've done this also in the um, uh, Fearing Sunset area and, you know, happy to do that almost anywhere else. Um, so definitely do that more. Um, looking at the public service piece, I mean, I think one thing, uh, a couple years ago, we released a report through community relations about uh, the numbers of students that, that do do volunteer service. And I think this is a conservative, but I had something like 9,000 students and 20,000 hours of, of community service within the community. Um, so we, we um, many of our students are giving already. Um, and, um, you know, and there are formal connections to many organizations. Uh, if there are 200 nonprofits in Amherst, and I think there are, um, there are, uh, you know, formal connections all throughout. So I can go on and on with this, but um, any ideas you have, please get in touch with me uh, because I think that we can make them happen. So, and just on a very direct uh, impact has been with our elections where students have signed up to work as election workers because we were worried about having enough election workers. A lot of people were, were choosing that the, it was not a safe place for them to work and we depend on a lot of uh, people who are normal folks who weren't able to do it. And we had an, over, an overabundance of election workers this year, mostly because it was a lot of young people who came forward. Uh, we had the athletic department reach out and say, we, we want to help get the vote out and do whatever we can help the town do. And we're, you know, engaging with them to help carry things around for us and things like that. So I think there is an interest, especially in the elections from our point of view, uh, where it's had a direct impact on our operations. Okay, so we have one getting back to your testing program. This is from Robin on the testing program. Uh, uh, co big compliment. The testing program is extraordinary and it's well done. And it looks like the majority of the positive cases have been on off-campus students. So it's, it's, you want to go back to um, that, how do you reach out to off-campus students to make sure they're tested? Are they required to be tested if they're taking an online class and you think they're local, you know, so this uh, not just waiting for them to ask to be tested. So um, is it just people who come on campus for a lab or is it mandated for all? So for the students who are living off campus, but but coming to campus either for a face to face class or a lab or um, they may have an essential job, such as um, our PB, our UMass Transit bus drivers they are required to be tested two times a week, um, similar to the students who are living on campus. For the other students who are living locally, but um, are not um, coming onto campus and they are doing all of their classes remotely, they are strongly encouraged to come on twice a week for testing. And this is something that we just expanded, I think it was a week and a half ago, last week. I have to admit, I'm starting to lose track of the days um, in this, what still feels like March, um, maybe April. Um, so the, um, we, we were able to extend that. Um, I will say that um, it's, even though it's not required, we are seeing um, a really strong response to that. And I know that when, um, you know, Tony has shared that when they've gone out on their, um, their knock and talks that, you know, to a person, everyone is talking about, oh, I got my test, I, I'm, I'm getting tested regularly. Um, and if any student comes on to uh, campus and goes to the Mullen Center for the test, um, we're not turning them away. We are, um, you know, come in, we will test you. And we're actually about to start um, promoting as well doing some, uh, the flu shots for our students at the same time because um, the governor is now mandating that um, students get a flu shot. So we'll be trying to combine that with the COVID testing for students to make it as um, easy as possible. But we're still working to get that um, ramped up. Okay, I don't think I'm seeing any more hands up on this. Um, so I, if I don't, I'll wait a second. We have, see if we... Kathy, I'm sorry, we have Robin with her hand up. Okay, so Robin has her hand up. Okay, I missed it. Okay, so bring Robin in. Funny, I don't. Robin, you need to unmute. Yep, it just did. Hello. Hi. Hi, can you hear me? 
Thanks, um, first of all, Paul, for answering that last question that I had posed about um, the follow-up contact tracing. The question that still I'm still confused about is um, when there's a party going on, it's clear that the students are already present, the risk has already occurred, or it's possibly occurring, right? Just as it would for any of us gathering. So not again, placing too much onus on the, on the students being different than anybody else. But we're looking at um, a gathering that is large enough that has either breached the mandate or breached the agreement already. The police have arrived because of, this, of the noise complaint is there a reason that information is not being gathered at that time that would enable actually accurate contact tracing? Because I can't imagine that two weeks later, if a student decides to go in and get tested because they're not feeling well or gets caught in an asymptomatic test, that they happen to be positive, that they will have any under knowledge of who was actually at that party. Right? I couldn't tell you if I went to a party of 25 people who was at the party. So I'm just wondering is every time I've looked at the incredible systems you guys have set up, it's amazing. I think we should be incredibly proud of our community and the work that the university has done and the town has done in response to all of this, this, this year. But that keeps coming up for me is that we're missing this opportunity for protecting the community. There's a lot of education. There's a lot of other stuff going on. But in that moment where there's the potential for spread, I feel like we're, we're missing an opportunity to gather information that would help us mitigate that risk. And I'm just wondering why we're not doing that. Thank you. Yeah, I understand that. Um, I think part of it is just capacity. We would not have the capacity to do contact tracing for all of those, um, if every sort of gathering that people potentially could have uh, been together I and mean, it, it could be a party of 10 or a, a dinner party of 10. Um, so I think that's one of the challenges. And also, I mean, what we're finding quite honestly is that the students are being tested pretty regularly, uh, you know, even off campus and they're, um, you know, um, they're showing their, their, their app saying, I've just tested uh, um, as, as negative. So I think that, um, my bigger concern is the community, if there's a large gathering in the community and, and tracking it. Um, you know, yeah, I, I don't, we see, I don't think, we see this at Mill River, right? You go to yeah. Mill River on a weekend, yeah. there's a huge number of people hanging around. Yeah. Nobody's masked. You know, there's, there's not a lot of education happening in, in that environment either, probably. And they're not getting access to, to testing. But if we are looking specifically just tonight at, at the student situation, I don't, we're not asking to have everybody contact traced if they haven't tested positive, but if you've got a bunch of 25 kids standing there, at least gathering their names and asking that question, have you been tested recently? If you haven't been tested, your name has been given to the university, you will be called in to be tested because you have already breached the community agreement you signed about not being at this size of a party and not social distancing. So you've already broken the agreement. So you need to go in and go get tested and need to demonstrate that you're not putting the community at risk. That would be the only, that's the only thing I was just thinking. It's like, a, yeah. is that different than the police? I mean, is that, is that, is that an impossible task to do? I don't, I'm just curious as to why we don't do something like that. I think where our system is set up to respond to actual cases of COVID-19, not every potential gathering of, you know, in a church or, a get, or a, any place like that. Mm -hmm. I mean, and just one, as a side note, we have hired two additional people to work in our parks and playgrounds um, uh, during key times to be able to help manage those areas as well and to do education and have masks with them and things like that. And those, those folks are starting this week as well um, on different schedules. Um, so going to Groff Park, Mill River, all the, all the major places so we can have a, more of a town presence. Um, what, we exp what we learned is that Puffers Pond, having a town presence there really helped manage that, uh, the Puffers Pond um, beach areas 
-hmm. really successfully this summer. We, that was one of our real worry, worry, worry spots, and it came out really well. And part of it was very informal, but um, a presence. And I think having a presence at the parks will help us on that. You know, in terms of, uh, I don't know, I have kids, and they can tell you exactly who was at every party that they've been to. Um, I don't think there's, um, they don't have short-term memory loss <laughs> like I do. <laughs> Yeah, no, I appreciate, I appreciate the, the limitations of resources. Yeah. Um, again, just trying to figure out if we're missing an opportunity to mitigate mm -hmm. spread um, and have the information at hand necessary to make that happen. Because you had mentioned that the registered parties, you guys give them a 20 minutes heads up. Mm -hmm. So all the kids, have, you know, they've disappeared, right? So you're, you're again, you're not, you're not talking to the group at the moment, identifying really how big a risk was this mm -hmm. and it being noted as such. I understand it's they're being fined for noise, but the focus and my concern is just about how we're how we're dealing with the COVID risk at that time. But thank you. Yep. Thank you, Robin. So uh, Angela, am I right? I'm not seeing any I I'm somehow missed Robin's hand. I don't think there are any hands up. I don't see any hands up either. You are correct. Okay, and I don't see any additional questions. So I wanna thank uh, Tony and Nancy. I think Paul is staying with us for the next topic. Um, and I wanna thank everyone who submitted questions or raised our hand. Happy, and just, to, just to draw your attention, there are a few more questions okay, for more, Tony and Nancy. Okay, more questions came in? Yep, Donna Barron asks, is there a target time frame for the university to make a decision about how many students will be invited back to campus this spring? Um, <laughs> it, that's what we're all asking. Um, there is a planning process. There's been a, there's a committee that, um, you know, is looking at all these issues. I think that, um, that process will be expanded. I would anticipate, um, later this fall, we will make an announcement. There are, um, different academic deadlines that we're pretty aware of and, um, want to be respectful of. So, um, I don't have an exact date for you and I don't have an exact process, but um, it is top of mind. And the other question is from um, Ava Fredkin. Since students living in dorms are required to be tested twice a week, why are off-campus students not required to do the same? The, the on-campus students um, are required. It's part of their residential life con uh, contract. And, and, and so uh, being on campus has, has, you know, we have more of a lever there to um, compel students to do the testing. Off campus, is, it's the same thing that we were talking about before in creating the culture of compliance. Uh, with off campus students, uh, they are, um, they're not under the same type of, uh, I, I control is the wrong word. Um, Nancy, give me another, give me a synonym there. But uh, I think you get the point. Um, so what we do is that we, again, we, we're teaming with our students to bring them in, I, the the numbers of unique tests are certainly making clear that our messaging is working, and I and you know the um, our students are coming in voluntarily to be tested um, and being tested frequently. So uh, I think at this point, because we're seeing such high numbers, we're we're quite confident um, that students are getting the message and want to be a part of the solution. I would also just quickly add um, that. Um, another uh, resource for us um, in with messaging our, our students' parents, and Tony and I are, are both um, parents of UMass students, and you know we're, we pay attention to things from that perspective as well, and um, see what's on social media. And I can tell you that we are constantly sharing our messaging with parents, and I see it happening all the time where the parents are saying, "Yeah, I told my my daughter and my son they needed to go get tested," um, and so that is a another avenue for us, and it's uh, one that's pretty effective. Yep. So, and so the last question's from Kathleen. She wants you to go back to that certain address on Fisher Street and make sure you give them a welcome bag. And there's a request that for the next Zoom call you bring Winston. <laughs> <laughs> So I just, I, I love that note. So I, I wanna thank the panelists. And the other thing I, I just wanna remind us all is that Amherst has actually been doing great. We, the number of positive cases um, is relatively small given the size of the, the mobile population we're talking about. So I think 
um, the importance that everyone is hoping is that we keep it looking great. We know we're heading into a colder season and the flu shots are coming. Um, so so I, I do think there, there's been a huge evolution from our thousands coming back to not as many coming back. What's the plan? And suddenly there seems to be a plan. And so I want to thank everybody. Um, and to have a dog join our team is just sort of a, a, an additional piece. So thank you very much for tonight. And um, both Sarah and I are gathering questions. So if more questions occur, and I think we can capture the questions and the answers because this was recorded. So we'll type it up. We're thinking, are there frequently asked questions that we can type up in some way and not just share with our district, but with other districts so that, so that you don't have to do the show everywhere. Um, but I just want to thank you very much. And I think we'll go to the next topic then. Great, and thanks for having thank us. You. Have a great thank night. You too. So Paul, I think you're on with the North Amherst Library. Sure. So um, I, again, will share my screen. Um, So uh, we had an anonymous donor step forward at, uh, who offered, there was a, um, bleh, back up. So Tommy appropriated funds to look into a feasibility study for um, developing an addition for um, the North Amherst Library, which we did. Um, a, an anonymous donor came forward and said, I'm interested in that. And um, let's, uh, I'd like to fund the next phase of the project, which is the design of the building and the construction documents so we could go out to bid with the intent that perhaps there'd be um, additional funds coming forward somehow to build the actual addition. So to orient you, I'm going to run sides through these sites as fast as I can, because I know the time we spent a lot more time on COVID than we thought. So this you're if at the bottom of the screen is the intersection are the new traffic lights that we'll talk about later. Uh, on the right is Montague Road on the left is Sunderland Road. You're looking fa face on to the North Amherst Library and behind that is the proposed addition, the footprint, the little gray area. Um, the so at the bottom is the existing library. There's the wheelchair lift with, with stairs and then the addition would include a meeting room. Uh, two restrooms and a storage area with a handicapped access through to the back um, where there'll be a new parking area, which is where uh, the, the um, where people park now, quite frankly, um, and that parking lot that was with the old gas station. So this, this is the design. I'm not going, I'm not an architect. I'm not going to talk to you about the, you know, fenestration and stuff like that, but um, we contract with Kuhn Riddle to look at the historic North Amherst Library and do an addition that was respectful of and reminiscent of the original building, but not a copycat. But they did, I thought they did a really good job of bringing the major elements of the existing North Amherst Library into the addition. Uh, this is a rendering. Uh, it's, it sort of looked like it's sitting in the middle of a prairie or something like that because they didn't do any of the background stuff, but um, this would be the entrance from the parking area um, on the north side of the library, which is where the gas station is. So you would enter the library this way. On the right is where the community room would be. And on the left is where the restrooms would be. And then you could walk up into the library. This is just another um, view of it. This is what it would look like from the rear of the building, the new addition. There'd be handicapped parking um, in the back as well. Um, I think that's it. Um, So, uh, and so wh where we are now is the town council has approved, has uh, accept, has voted to accept the donation and to move forward on the project. Uh, the next thing we will do is, we, I saw some email traffic today, contracting with Kuhn Riddle to move to the next phase. Um, the next phase will be to take that rendering and reduce it and get into more of the design elements. Um, and then at the conclusion of that, come back with actual construction plans and then we'll, once we have the money in hand, we can then go out to bid and actually do construction. If all things uh, line up accurately, we'll be going out. We'd love to, if the money comes in, in we'll be looking to do, go out to bid in the spring of 2021. And, you know, I just want to thank the anonymous donor for coming forward for this significant 
uh, improvement uh, to the North Amherst community. It's not just an improvement to the library. There aren't um, community rooms in North Amherst that, you know, the district councilors can really have a meeting. It's um, not a large community room. I think that holds 30, 40 people, something like that. Um, but it will be um, a big asset and a big um, important addition to North Amherst. Um, and also it's just, to me, it's like, we need some good news. Um, and this is an exciting, good project happening at a really tough time of everyone's lives. So I think this will be a, 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 a jolt of positivity for the, our community, so. So Paul, is there also, is there a phase where you have a building committee or um, community members can, as they, the design mm -hmm. gets more solid, they can see what it looks like, send comments in? Yes. So, um, so again, we're in the we're in this new COVID world. So we're looking at different options, and this is actually a, a really nice little um, tight project where we're looking at different options for people to be involved electronically. Um, and uh, we can do sort of socially distanced meetings, but uh, but we're going to be doing being doing all the work during the winter. So we have looked at some programs. Uh, Brianna Sunred, our communications manager where there will be a project page that sort of establishes not just a website, but it's a way for someone who can't show up at a specific time to uh, participate in the process, uh, see all the questions and answers that have been posed previously, um, weigh in on their own, and there's different aspects of it. So we're, we wanna use this, this project as a test case for that. We of course would wanna get members of the community um, to participate in terms of help guiding some of these questions. You know, it's, you know, we obviously need someone from the library to participate in this as well, since it's really gonna be their primary home. And we want them to be involved. We need people, you know, engineers from the town to be involved and maintenance people from the town to be involved. So we want everybody who's gonna be impacted by this um, to have, um, have weigh in during the design process so that we're not just designing in a vacuum and coming out and saying, here's something that looks great uh, without having touch base with everybody. Um, so we are considering a um, building, uh, building committee, a small building committee to help work through all these different aspects of it. So are there any questions from people um, raising hands, comments? Let me see, are these new? Oh, these are more. So we have a raised hand in the attendees and we have two typed questions. Where would you like to start? Uh, do the raised hands. I'm not seeing any raised hands, Angela, so there's something odd about my, um, so you call on them. Um, I'm going to bring Mary back in to the panelist room. Hi. Um, can you hear me? Yes. Good. Um, I just wanted to um, thank the donor because I think this, as Paul said, is just the most wonderful positive thing that's happening right now and mm -hmm. um, everyone I've talked to has been delighted by I downloaded the, the, the I don't know what you call them plans from the the um, town site and I just everybody is really positive about this and I think it's a, a wonderful way to um, bring North Amherst community together. So I'm, I'm just delighted and I, I know a lot of people are. So mm -hmm. that's all I wanted to say. Yes, it's good to hear, thank you. Sweet. So it looks like Meg Gage is the other hand that's up. Okay, I'll bring Megan, but while we're bringing Megan, there's a question, does the plan include an increase in space for the books? I think the uh, addition is for the two restrooms, a storage area, which would be where you can return books and a community room. You know, I, we've talked a little bit about, about maybe should there be books or um, in that, in the community room. But I think that the idea is that the, it will not include additional uh, space for books. Um, so then, Meg is the hands that are up. Meg's in the room. Just Meg's in the room. Add on to Mary's thank you to the donor and to the town and to Paul for moving this forward when you have so much else going on. A lot of our kids grew up going to that library and learning to read there and getting books out and returning them. And um, it's really wonderful to see that we're gonna have a better library and uh, it's just, 
wonderful the donor did this. So thank you. And especially thank you also, not especially, thank you to the donor, but also the town for actually doing this because so much is going on right now. It would have been easy for this to be pushed out. over. <laughs> so um, one of the related questions, so I just want to, we, we're all thrilled and just so people Paul went through the designs very quickly but anyone who wants to see them there will be two bathrooms and as he said we'll have a community room and we're going to be able to have access to it when the library isn't open because there will be key fobs so we can be scheduling meetings and it will be a public piece so one question that just came in I do know the answer to this but I'll let you say it Paul is there any plan to redo the street patterns are we still on a, are we still on a holding um, Pattern. I know the library plan does not interfere with potential plans to redo the street patterns, but what is the larger piece? Yes, that's a really good question. So when, when Kuhn Riddle was doing the design, we said, we don't know what's going to happen with the street patterns. You need to do it within the constraints of whatever happens in that intersection. They were able to accomplish that successfully, including the parking and everything. Um, so there are, there's no funding for any kind of changes to the street pattern up there. I think the sort of uh, intervening step has been the introduction of the new traffic lights, which are, you know, we deemed our ugly version because it was sort of done pretty efficiently and uh, relatively on the cheap. It wasn't the right, it wasn't exactly what we would have designed typically. Um, and so I think, you know, at the, for the time being, we, we, you know, we have tried multiple times for Mass Works grants to redo the intersection, um, and they have not come to fruition. The, the plans are still there, the, the hope is still there, but at this point in time, I can't offer any hope for that happening anytime soon. Okay. Um, it looks like Mary's hand went up again, or is that from before? Uh, it, her hand went down, or did she come back it's, in? No, I'm, I'm there. Um, okay. Hi, Mary. Uh, I, another quick question was, the town bought the garage, and I was just wondering, it's kind of an eyesore and probably a hazard, and I was wondering if the, I don't know, whether the town DPW or somebody um, is able to just remove that and, and level it, and maybe have it as part of the parking lot until road plans eventually get done. So, so yes, I mean, it is an eyesore. There's no question about that. The only thing that we've had in mind in, um, was that uh, when, if assuming the construction moves forward on the library, the contractor may want to use that as a staging area for, for material and equipment as in a, in a construction office and instead of bringing in trailers and, and storage units. And so we sort of not moved on that thinking that um, that might be a benefit to a contractor um, and because it's, it doesn't have use in for anything else. You know, we've looked at um, activating the restrooms in there and it's, they're just beyond repair. Um, but that was, that's the only, that's the main major thing is holding us back on that. Okay, so holding us back. We, we'd like to use it, uh, have a contractor use it uh, for storage and offices rather than bring in a lot of trailers. Yeah, that makes a lot of sense. Uh, so, but, but there is plans after the library's done to demolish that. Yeah. Yeah, great, yes. thanks. Hey, um, I, I, there's one question just, I think we're moving toward closing and I'll do a quick update on the intersection, but we wanna also get anyone who's in, in the audience to suggest future topics. But one person asked whether we um, are uh, going, whether we're recording this meeting and where will they find the recording? The answer is we are recording it, and I should have announced that at the beginning. And we, um, I can get you information later. Usually these recordings are available with a day or two lag before we figure out where we put them. Um, so stay tuned, Paul, unless you can tell people where they could find the recording. I don't, I don't know. So most of these go on to our YouTube channel. We have a town of Amherst YouTube channel and they can be found there, but you're right, Kathy, it does take a few days to upload them. Okay, so I, I'll just give a quick, we put on the agenda, Hilda has a question on the eruptor, but Hilda, let me just wait for that question. So just on the traffic lights, um, I think people have probably noticed, but we have a new set of traffic lights in that intersection by the library. And I just have to tell you that lots of you 
came to different meetings asking for these over the years to at least put in what's called a smart light. So there's a green turn signal with a delay. And the, it also has a counting um, mechanism that I'm not sure that's up yet, but Guilford had told us that we will be able to get a sense of the traffic flow, both, both foot traffic, bicycle traffic, and car traffic. Mm -hmm. So at some point, I want to encourage everyone to be walking and biking through that intersection <laughs> so they get counted because we've never had, um, we can show in the summer, there's a lot of foot traffic back and forth across that intersection in terms of the design for the future if we didn't just have a traffic light. But the town did respond and we have this light that um, at least my experience is I'm getting through faster. I'm not backed up all the way to 116 anymore in either, or in the other direction. So it went up and it's working. And I, I guess the one, other, so I want to just throw it open to questions and any suggestions about future topics. And Hilda has sent in one. Do we know anything more about the project called the Eruptor? Is it um, still potentially there, when will we know anything more? Um, so I'm not totally on top of that. I know uh, Dave Zomack's been working closely on that and I think they're going after a federal grant. Um, and I don't know a whole lot more about the status of that, but I know they've been working um, at pretty high level with gov uh, Congress, Congressman McGovern on getting funding to support some of the work that needs to happen for the eruptor, but I don't know I'm not, I don't know the status of the grant, if it's an in or not or whatever. Okay, well, Sarah and I can follow up. And I see Hilda's hand is up, Sarah. was Hilda, was that the same question or do you want to be brought in to? Um, okay, so I've got some future topics. It's, did Hilda get brought in? Yes, I brought her in. Okay. Hilda, you have to unmute. All right, my question was, about oh about the election coming up because there's a question on um, rank choice voting that's question two on the ballot and and also I see that there's a meeting on Tuesday of the town with the lawyer about rank choice voting and it's very complicated and I'm trying to figure it out whether I want it or I don't want it but I guess one of my big questions is how would those ballots be counted and how much this is, I guess, for some future meeting very soon before the election anyway. Uh, what does the town need to do to change all the hardware and software that we have for ballot counting if rank choice voting passes? That's so I, so I can, there's two different things. One is rank choice voting, which is the ballot initiative that's on the ballot on November 3rd. Right. Um, and that's a standalone thing versus what the town charter has uh, set up the the rank choice voting commission, which is looking at right. utilizing rank choice voting for local elections. The rank choice voting commission met today. Uh, they're doing tremendous work. They've got very detailed plans. They're working with the town, the acting town clerk now was the town clerk and um, to um, talk about the machines that need to happen, whether the means machines have to be approved by the state or not. Uh, that's why they're meeting with the town attorney who used to be the chief elections officer for the state, uh, chief elections legal uh, consultant for the, for the state, Lauren Goldberg. And um, so, but you know, I think you'll be really impressed by the work that the Ranked Choice Voting Commission has done. Their goal is, their, their requirement is that they give a measure to the town council by December 1st, and then the town council um, will start to investigate how to implement ranked choice voting. But you don't have any idea of the cost uh, or what? No, no, no idea. But if the state, if the people vote yes in the referendum, would we be required? Are, they, are these two independent processes or does- Yes, independent processes. So and most likely, state passes that that has nothing to do with the local. Um, I don't know enough about what the state would require. I'm sure that the legislature will get involved in exactly what's going to happen in terms of um, how it gets implemented, because it's. And I think that's going to be a, a challenge for the town of Amherst as well, because um, I think they'll want to make sure that all the uh, rank choice voting, once it gets implemented, is being done the same way in all communities. Is so there I, any idea that we might have an answer to this, how much the cost might be by the election? 
I think they're just identifying the equipment they would need. So I don't know. That's a question for the Ranked Choice Voting Commission. I was just. Thank you. Hey, I want to be conscious of time. I know Sarah told me she had a hard stop in at 7.30, which is now. Um, so I see there's at least one more um, question sent in about when the council is going to talk about the Jones Library, the more major project, but maybe we can, we can table a few of these additional questions. We will definitely be happy to do another district meeting and Lynn Griesmer is in the audience as are um, uh, Andy Steinberg were and Alyssa uh, Brewer. So people are seeing these questions as they come in. So I encourage you for future topics, um, broad ranging or small, email Sarah and I, either one of us, because um, we'd like to know the issues and including if you want to hear from particular people. Paul has been very generous with his time. He's a little more careful with all his staff time, but when it's really... <laughs> except <laughs> when it's, Angela. <laughs> except Angela, but, but um, this is an after hours for them. But um, if they are the only people to answer some questions and it's particular to either our district or townwide, please let us know. So I just, I want to thank everybody for um, sitting through a, uh, the hour and a half, but Paul, you stayed with us the whole time. So yeah. thank you very much. Thank you for organizing it. Thank you, Angela. So thank you, everyone. I think we are going to end this. It will be recorded and um, everyone has my email. I don't necessarily have everyone's email, although we do know who is a participant here. So I, I know the person who asked about the recording. If you just want to email me that you want to know where to find the recording, once I know, I will let people know where to find it. So I think, um, Sarah, do you want to say some parting words, too? <laughs> no, thank you, Angela. Thank you, Paul. And it was great to be able to answer some questions. I know that Kathy and I are meeting with another small group tomorrow. But thank you to the town for really being, and the university, for being very receptive. And thank you to District 1 members who always have a lot of questions to ask and always have a lot of good input. So mm -hmm. thank you. And good night for me. Good night, everyone. Good night. Good night. Good night. We're going offline now. Thanks, everybody.